So uh, Simon and David are going to introduce the next two panels, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first panel. So going alphabetically, uh, Kathy Kramer is the Natalie Horton Chair of uh, Letters and Science and Virginia Sapiro Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin. Kathy is an amazing political scientist who has written one of the best works on grievances and disaffection among the American public and workers and politics of resentment. And I had the pleasure of working with Kathy in the context of reimagining our economy report by the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which she co-led, I must say, masterfully, but also amazingly emphatically, empathically. So I'm grateful for Kathy for agreeing to travel to Cambridge uh, to be part of this panel. Liz Schuler is president of AFL-CIO, the Democratic Federation of 60 national and international unions representing 12, 12, 12, 12 and a half million working people. What makes Liz such a perfect person for our panel is that she has not just focused on work of the future, uh, transition to clean energy, workforce development, uh, empowerment of women and young workers, but she has made the labor movement's engagement with AI a centerpiece of her leadership. Liz created the AFL-CIO uh, Technology Institute, which she co-leads with Amanda Ballantyne, who's also here. Thanks for coming, Amanda. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and this is going to be a really uh, transformative event, I think, for the labor movement's engagement with technology and leadership for the labor movement. We are grateful to Liz for making the time in the midst of her incredibly busy schedule to come and be part of this panel. Kathy Thielen is fourth professor of political science at MIT and has been an intellectual trailblazer on the issues that are central to this panel. Uh, she has done path-breaking work on the historical evolution of the labor market institutions in Europe, especially in Germany. I had the pleasure of learning a lot from uh, Kathy's work when I was more engaged on the German training system, subsequently greatly benefited from her scholarship on the German labor movement. She's now working on issues that are central to the American political economy and the future of market economy, and it is a true pleasure to uh, be able to have Kathy on this panel as well. Glenn Weil, who will chair the panel, is founder and research lead of the Microsoft Research Special Project, the Plural Technology, and, co uh, and founder of the uh, Radical Exchange Foundation. His 2018 book with Eric Posner, Radical Markets, anticipated many of the issues we are grappling with today, including data ownership, data rights, data markets. And his new book with Audrey Tang, Plurality, the Future of Collaborative Technology and Democracy, is even more ambitious, and I recommend it strongly, and gets to the heart of the dilemma challenging us today. Glenn has also been an amazingly generous person with me and Simon in the process of writing our book. Uh, he spent uh, countless hours with us providing uh, comments and an insider's perspective on the ideas and the directions of technology in Silicon Valley. I'm truly grateful to Glenn for also agreeing to chair this panel, even though he just got back from Asia after a long trip to Boston. So thank you, everybody. Say, um, let's give a warm welcome to our speakers. Thank you. Well, th thanks so much, Daron. It's, it's really an honor to be here with you all. Um, I'm sorry that I'm only joining for the afternoon and that I missed the memo on how to dress, uh, given that I just got back from Taiwan at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. So um, by the way, incidentally, Taiwan is just a fascinating example for all these issues. And uh, I've been trying to involve Daron and others in uh, studying it. It's, uh, you see it palpably on the streets and you can read it in the economic statistics I've been able to find. They've actually seen over the last decade a decline in their Gini index, an increase in their labor share, and they have the most tech intense uh, economy in the world. It seems like there's actually more SIM cards than there are people in the population in Taiwan. And pretty much uh, everything seems to connect to technology in some way. So uh, really, really interesting example to think about in this regard. Um, I'm also happy to be here with both uh, hopefully new friends and a very old friend, Kathy, uh, who is kind of uh, a bit of my parallel life. Uh, Kathy's uh, husband and my wife are both Latin Americanists who drag us uh, all around uh, Latin America. And uh, so we have plenty of time to sort of uh, commiserate and celebrate together uh, uh, that life. Um, you know, what I really love about both this project and uh, Daron and Simon's book is the theme of agency over the future of technology that Daron was just emphasizing. And I really want this panel to draw that out. It seems to me that critical to having agency 
is confronting technology with a sense of what are the challenges that it creates, what are the opportunities that it creates, and what work do we collectively need to do for ourselves in order to maximize uh, you know, the opportunities and minimize the challenges. And uh, I hope those are the points we'll keep in mind as we go through this panel. And uh, without further ado, I want to turn to Kathy, uh, the first Kathy, uh, <laughs> Kathy Kramer, to uh, tell us a little bit about how workers are thinking about these issues um, and uh, how they affect the future of their uh, lives. So, Thanks so much. Yes, thank you, Glenn, and hello, everybody, and Daron and Simon and David. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part. I learned uh, so much from this morning and really looking forward to this conversation. So um, as Daron mentioned, and um, I have had the pleasure of experiencing with some um, important colleagues in my life right here at, in your own MIT, I have been listening to workers of a variety of backgrounds for most of my career. Um, but most recently, the commission that Drone and I were on together that I, that I had the joy of co-chairing for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, we used a platform that's been developed here at MIT and powered by um, the Center for Constructive Communication uh, in your MIT Media Lab and um, the associated nonprofit Cortico. This, we use a platform to listen to people from across the country in 20 different states uh, that included a variety of workers, um, from teachers to people in the service industry to small business owners. And I just want to share with you some of the things that, that I heard. Um, first and foremost, we asked them to share their, their concerns, um, uh, their hopes, their dreams for what their lives would be like, and, and their thoughts about what they think currently powers our economy. And first and foremost, they weren't asking for much. So one guy, and I should also mention my colleague Josh Flax, who's also with the Center for Constructive Communication. Um, they, one man in Kentucky just said simply, look, I'm not looking for a mansion on a hill. I'm looking for things like time with my family, time to do things other than work, um, a job that enables me to be a human not a job that destroys my humanity. So we were talking to people sometimes at, at very low, the lower ends of the income spectrum, but oftentimes we aim for people more in the, in the middle. And really what they were saying to us was um, pretty basic. The things they were looking for were not that complicated. They're just the things that allow humans to be humans. Again, time with people that they care about relationships, and they also wanted some sense of um, voice, worker voice, right? I don't need to say that to this crowd, but um, a sense that not only were they respected in the workplace, but that their, their thoughts, their wisdom in the workplace was being listened to and at some point acted on, not just listened to, but actually acted on. So um, in general, I would say, that what we heard from workers across the country was not complicated. It's pretty straightforward when each of you thinks about what do I want, what kind of life do I want to live, right? You want a life in which you're respected, in which you have relationships, time for relationships, and also, if possible, work that's meaningful to you. Right, work that enables you to live your values. That almost sounds like I'm asking for a lot here, right? Doesn't it almost sound like, wow, what jobs enable you to live your values? But it shouldn't be asking for a lot. People saw that, and they said it in very different, various ways, but um, pretty straightforward. And I'll just end by saying, as a political scientist, my concern is not just that people are disgruntled in the workplace, but my concern is that when people feel like they are voiceless, in this aspect of life that is such a huge part of our lives in terms of time, in terms of energy, just in terms of our, our mental energy, right? That it leads to, it makes the space for resentment. It makes the space for people to look around for targets of blame. Why do I dislike my life so much, right? And we have seen what that can lead to. So uh, I, again, I'm super uh, honored to be a part of this panel to have this conversation. So thanks, Glenn. Is. I can relate so much to what you were saying because we are the people you study 
all right? Um, I'm representing the AFL-CIO, which is, uh, as was said, an umbrella organization of unions, 12 and a half million workers, but from every sector of the economy. A lot of people have a stereotype of what they think unions represent. It is every single type of job, right? And even more so in the emerging sectors of the economy. We're seeing a lot of tech workers organizing. Um, and I have had the privilege to travel the country, to walk on these picket lines you've been seeing rising up all over the country um, and talking with workers every single day. Um, being in some of the rooms where I, I'm trying to bring their voice and their perspective because often we don't hear e from each other, frankly. Um, I'm a fish out of water in this room and I could bring you, Daron, into a union meeting and you would feel like a fish out of water, right? So I think the point here is that we all need to be in each other's spaces more. Mm -hmm. um, because what I'm hearing, and of course I just got back from our uh, Labor Innovation Technology Lit Summit, <laughs> Um, alongside the Consumer Electronics Show. Anybody been to CES? Mm -hmm. Okay, you know of it, right? Biggest technology purveyors in the world show their wares. We had a group of union leaders and activists walk through that show. And guess what? Worker perspective on display because every booth they went to, the person giving the tech was saying, this used to take 12 jobs and now it only takes one. <laughs> Do you know who you're talking to here? <laughs> that nurse? could put that Abbott Labs representative through the ringer about some of the technologies they were showing. Mm -hmm. Because professional judgment still matters. Uh, and so to be able to have that infused perspective into the creation of technology is what we're talking about upstream, not when the technology lands in a workplace. And so we've seen what's gone bad. We've seen that workers have been left out, even though often our wages are the ones that are the taxpayer investments that have unleashed a lot of these technologies. Um, so we've been seeing a lot of um, you know, concerns around technologies being used to hire, technologies being used to fire um, in ways that are biased and discriminatory, um, not to mention dehumanizing. If you're an Amazon warehouse worker and you're followed to the bathroom and surveilled with a wearable, uh, you could be fired by an app and literally have no recourse or ability to, to protest or do anything about it. Um, we, are, we saw technology at CES where meatpacking facilities are now using military technology to monitor every movement. If you stop to wipe the sweat from your brow, you could actually be docked pay or disciplined because time off task. Um, so these are the concerns that workers are facing right now in the workplace. And seven out of 10 workers fear that their jobs will be displaced by technology. That's real polling right now. Um, and fear is destabilizing, as we just talked about. Um, so we see a better path forward. What we see is involving workers, not only with a voice at the table, but to have more say with collective action and collective bargaining to balance the scales of power and how these technologies are developed, deployed, utilize the data that is being collected and used, um, and to really bring more workers in the process of the research and development, ex, you know, gathering their expertise and collaborating with them when it comes to um, you know, uh, in, uh, developing these technologies. Um, otherwise, we see the alternative, right? That if workers are d disenfranchised and left behind, it is destabilizing for our economy, uh, for our democracy and for our humanity. Great, thanks, Liz. Um, Kathy T will give us a bit of a more comparative perspective on these well, issues. From yeah, the United thanks States. so much um, for for inviting me to to participate in this. Um, I thought what I would do is and it links up exactly to what uh, what Liz was just saying and what Kathy said earlier. Um, I thought I'd give a couple of general kind of overarching points from a more comparative perspective. As Daron mentioned, uh, I do, I've in the past studied labor uh, and industrial relations, mostly in Northern Europe. Um, and basically, the first point that I want to make is that this kind of anxiety about technology um, that, that Liz was just talking about is really much reduced 
uh, when workers and their representatives are meaningfully included in um, the introduction of these new technologies. So if you look at um, the literature on comparative industrial relations or comparative political economy generally, you're going to find that the most successful cases um, are precisely in those countries like Germany, like Scandinavia, where you have first a very strong national safety net, sort of as a floor mm -hmm. on all that is going to occur uh, in all of these factories and, uh, and workplaces, but also that organized labor has um, a real presence and a meaningful voice in these kinds of, 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 of decisions. So that you know, the most successful cases are those in which you do get the implementation of new technologies, but in ways that protects the interests of workers, while at the same time, of course, you know, benefiting, you know, sort of re realizing some of the interests and some of the efficiency gains that employers are also, of course, after. Um, what's also clear, uh, I think, from a comparative perspective, is that worker voice um, in the implementation of these technologies is most effective when local labor representatives are involved early on, as Liz was just saying. But also, um, I think what's really important is where plant level negotiations are embedded in more encompassing, more uh, overarching, either collective bargaining or, or, or statutory arrangements. This embeddedness is really important because it sets some sort of fundamental guardrails, a sort of fundamental floor on the negotiations that occur at the local level. It sets the parameters within which those uh, local negotiations take place so that local labor representatives are not in a position of sort of negoti negotiating everything from scratch. They're negotiating with something to, to uh, with some foundation that they can, uh, that, that they can fall back on. Um, I guess a second, and I could give a, a, a good example of the kind of this kind of um, balanced uh, approach to the introduction of new technologies. Maybe I can save that for later. Uh, but the second sort of overarching point uh, that I wanted to make is that I think it's important. It's not just a matter of uh, labor representatives being informed early on about the plans that managers or employers have with respect to the introduction of new technologies. They also really have to be equipped with the kind of expertise or the kind of knowledge mm -hmm. that will allow them to anticipate and to um, to sort of predict and, and forestall some of the negative impact that these technologies uh, might have. And that's, of course, important because it's not always obvious when these technologies are getting introduced what all the downstream implications of this uh, are going to be. And you know, local labor representatives are not tech experts. Um, and so this is something that's been a big issue and problematized in a, in a fairly significant way in Germany, where unions are w running all sorts of uh, you know, research and, and running workshops and so forth. Um, but also importantly, um, this was the sort of key idea behind a, the recent innovation of the Co-Determination Act in Germany. Um, basically, it's, it's called the uh, Works Council Modernization Act. It was passed a couple of years ago. So what you need to know is that German co-determination plant level rights were already very strong. Plant level works councils already had um, extensive information rights. They already have very strong rights to negotiate over a whole wide range of issues that affect pretty much any, you know, any change in work organization. But what this new uh, co-determination law did was it also now gives works councils uh, the right to enlist the support of a technology expert, an outside technology expert paid for by the company so that they can bring them in to help them understand this technology, to help them anticipate um, uh, some of the, the consequences that this will have for the workforce. And I just think this is really important because this gives these labor representatives, above and beyond just information, uh, sort of uh, the foundation for really negotiating in a constructive way um, as these new technologies are getting, uh, are getting introduced. And just as a final thing, I just want to say, I don't want this to, I don't want to present a sort of overly sanguine picture of how things always operate uh, in, in, in Europe or even in these strong labor countries. It's not, you know, I've been to Sweden, I've seen the future and it works, some kind of thing. Um, I just want to, these are for me kind of proof of concept types of examples. Um, 
These are things that exist in the world and that seem to be working rather well. And it's in that, it's in that spirit that I offer these quite positive examples. Excellent. That's great, Kathy. And um, I, uh, I prepared some questions, but just following up on that and what, what the other Kathy said earlier, uh, so I just came back from uh, Asia, as, as mentioned a couple of times. One place we stopped on the way was Japan. And something that struck me really, really strongly there, and to a lesser extent in Taiwan as well, is that there is a focus, both in the educational system and uh, most dramatically, there's this museum called um, Miraikon uh, in, a, in Tokyo that is like a museum of emerging technologies. And in a way that I've never seen anywhere in the West, including in Scandinavia, there was like a very clear attempt to prepare the public to play a role in shaping the future of technology, to really like game out where technologies might go, how it might affect workers, elderly people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And to make that part of, like Museum of Science here, wonderful museum, doesn't really try to engage people in that way in actually like thinking about the future. What role do you think that kind of public investment in thinking together with the public plays in equipping people to have that agency that you're describing. And this is both relevant to both of Kathy's comments. Oh, I have lots to say on that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, play, it could play a huge role, right? But I think in so many respects, there's this large and perhaps growing divide between people who um, create things or make decisions and the people who are affected by those decisions. That's certainly the case in the economy, but not, that's not the only realm of the US um, and many other industrialized countries. And so we're, we're not used to <laughs> engaging the broader public in the project of what should we be five years, 10 years, 20 years from now. It's very un unfamiliar. Um, and, but the, the downside is that um, wisdom is not just held by the people who make decisions. The people who are affected by the decisions have all kinds of wisdom and information that would be very useful for um, increasing the quality of those decisions. But when you, know, um, when you have a situation in which the people who could be helping you create the future are afraid to what it's gonna do to their jobs, um, there's less of an incentive for it, for that to happen because people making decisions are afraid of losing power and the people who have the wisdom are afraid of putting themselves out of a job. Didn't Liz, Kathy, anything to add? Yeah, I'll just jump in quickly because I want to hear what you have to say. But um, I think, you know, newsflash, people hate change. Um, change is hard and you need a way to socialize change when you're going through these big disruptions. And you think about all the big disruptions coming at us. Um, we have you know, climate change coming at us. We've got obviously the, um, the destabilized democracy we're living in right now. We've got future of work and technology. We have you know, racial justice um, issues that you know, we're grappling with and on and on. So we believe that in order to navigate through these big changes, you need a stabilizing force. You need a place where people can go and get trusted information from people that they know aren't biased. And we believe that there is a role for unions to play in this way because we have worker uh, relationships in a workplace where people see each other every day. It's not um, a social media rabbit hole. It's not. Um, you know, biased information they're getting from somewhere else in their perspective. It's a real person that they know and that they trust. Um, so I think that uh, the J Japanese example is unique in the sense that um, in, in the U.S. we don't invest in long-term systematic, uh, you know, levers that we pull to make change. It's basically okay, here's the change yeah. and then get used to it. Um, so if we could institute a system that's you know, a long-term look with all the stakeholders at the table, we can learn from past mistakes of deindustrialization and other things that have happened in this country and get everybody into the room and, and make this right. Yeah, so just tagging on to all of that, I think that's really right. And I mean, the, the difference, 
One difference to the countries that I study the most intensely in and, and the United States is the unions have a very prominent role in public discourse in these countries, as they should in all countries. Mm -hmm. But it just is the fact that they are part of, the, part of the conversation. That's just how it operates there. But above and beyond that, I really do think that it's important um, and or what I observe from these countries is that they all the labor movement also thinks it is super important to have their own research departments, to have their own uh, workshops, to have their own outreach programs that are specifically not just you know targeted at sort of understanding this technology, but really cultivating you know concrete strategies that they can hand to um, to local <laughs> labor representatives who are confronted with this stuff on a kind of everyday uh, everyday kind of way. So. Uh, that's that's very interesting. I, one one thing I read a lot as a result of this experience was Edward Deming's work and sort of this thinking that's so prominent in East Asia of bringing that knowledge to workers for the purposes of them actually improving the quality of products. Because if they understand the systems that they're part of, then they can find the mm -hmm. you know where that touches their work, so that they feel holistically empowered rather than just isolated to the task that they're supposed to perform. Anyways, I, I'm not sure if that's something that, you know, it's obviously been relevant to the productivity of the Asian, Asian economies as well. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, Kath, Kathy T, I wanted to ask you um, a bit about the technology industry itself. Um, you know, tech companies have some of the lowest, other than uh, extractive industries, labor share in the economy. And so obviously it you know, uh, leads you to ask questions about labor power in that industry. But also the question is, are the formal workers of those companies, the tech workers, you know, so-called, the right focus for that energy? Um, there's so many other relevant stakeholders who are doing work-like things that feed into it, whether it's the independent contractors or people who are classified that way in a lot of the gig economy, whether it's the content creators who fuel so many of the uh, AI model development, the suppliers of those companies, um, you know, the uh, people who are participating in these social media platforms and producing the environment. So how do you think about what we mean in the tech sector or, and, and, you know, software's eating the world, so maybe that's broader than the tech sector, narrowly conceived. How do you think about these different stakeholders and how, how does the labor movement respond to give, give voice to these people? Well, I mean, so one positive uh, development is that we are seeing more organization among tech workers. And, but the more general, the more general thing that I think you're pointing to is, is these different sorts of you know, atypical work, sort of outside the normal or the usual standard employment relationship with whatever benefits that comes attached to that. And so you have what David Weil has called the fisherization of work, and you have all sorts of, of people in, um, including in these big tech uh, in these big tech firms, which, by the way, like huge shares of, of, of the people who work at, at these big tech platforms or these big tech companies are actually, you know, outsourced cleaning staff and et cetera, et cetera, or, or, or independent contractors. Um, and there, I just think, I mean, first of all, you know, sectoral bargaining helps a lot because you get coverage of, uh, of workers that wouldn't otherwise be, be covered. So I think that's actually something that is one of these foundational foundational uh, sort of floors that actually helps you know lift the lift the the, the, the status and, 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 and security of, of, of workers on a broad scale um, but then you know beyond that I just think that it is you know there are initiatives in in, um, in Europe uh, to uh, to allow for certain kinds of independent contractors or certain categories of independent contractors to, um, to negotiate collectively with their employers. Mm -hmm. um, there's you know, European Court of Justice uh, jurisprudence now that said, I forget the exact language, that basically says that um, if you have a shared employer and if you're in a weak "Quote unquote weak bargaining position," then you are then it, then independent contractors have collective bargaining rights mm -hmm. as well, and that seems like something. And now uh, legislation, European level legislation, is in the in the works on that, and that seems to be the, to me to be the kind of uh, positive development that might uh, that might capture some of these uh, some of these um, workers that are otherwise sort of uncovered by uh, any kind of union uh, union uh, protections. Liz and Kathy, C, do you want to do anything? No, I'm just learning from her. Yeah. <laughs> We're learning from each other. Um, 
So I would say um, no matter what type of work you do, we're seeing the same themes emerge. Um, you know, more precarity, less control over your schedules, um, you know, less ability to um, have a voice and have power in your workplace, um, fighting back against sexual harassment and discrimination. Um, no matter if you're a video game developer or you're someone who's working on a farm or um, working in the healthcare setting, you name it, um, we've just been seeing time and time again workers are basically in solidarity with each other rising up and finding their power and their voice in this moment. We had record years of strikes in the past couple of years for a reason, because working people are fed up and they're fired up. And outside this room, people are struggling. I mean, this is people working two and three jobs, right? Um, I was just down in Alabama for our Civil and Human Rights Conference, and they said, oh, well, people down here think, I'm trying to do my southern accent, um, <laughs> that you know, 725 an hour is plenty to live on. Well, if you get three of them jobs, you know, it's 725, that's over $21 an hour. Yeah. That's unsustainable, right? right? right. Um, and so I think um, I'll leave you with one number, and that is 88%. 88% of young people under the age of 30 are pro-union in this country. Mm. So if we're talking about emerging sectors, we're talking about emerging jobs, where all these young people are coming in, different expectations, the economy has been broken and not worked for them for far too long, they are ready for something different, and they're looking to unions modern, flexible, nimble unions, reinventing collective bargaining to apply to new types of work and sectors, that's what our hope is, is that we can capitalize on this momentum and apply it to all these new industries. So Liz, following up on that, um, I think you know many are obviously concerned about generative AI and its potential impacts on the labor market. Obviously, that's a motivation for this whole initiative. Um, and core to the capabilities of these models is training data, um, and many, you know, so far it's mostly come from these open online, uh, you know, databases, but there's increasing interest in using uh, multimodal you know, data that comes from workplaces and from uh, data gathered on uh, process of work and, and all that. How do you think about bringing those things and the potential models that could come out of them into the terms of negotiations with uh, employers? Yes, um, just an emerging, yet another challenge that's yeah. um, happening so fast and collective bargaining, we're trying to keep up with it, right? And that's why these last strikes that we saw were so important with the actors and the writers and even the auto workers is, you know, how do we compare notes with each other in collective bargaining and get the best language and the most, um, you know, potent guardrails? Um, and I think data is one of those pieces that we're seeing more and more of. Um, and, you know, um, how do you bargain over data used for safety versus disciplinary reasons? And that's something that we've seen in some of our bargaining agreements. Okay, and the employer wants to learn from how a worker is showing up in a job. And we've been doing this decade after decade, say in transportation, for example, train operators, pilots, you know, they've had video surveillance in their workplaces forever. But we've been able to bargain how that data is used and not used, um, more importantly. Um, and the way we're seeing data now um, blur the lines between home and work, too, because we're all carrying our devices. And um, now we're seeing pandemic when working people were working from their home computers, right, that they're being surveilled by the keystrokes and people were getting those mouse jigglers because they were afraid to go to the bathroom and have, you know, productive time um, be recorded uh, as not being productive. And so I think we've seen examples of Amazon, again, you know, the warehouse wearables. Um, the one example I'd like to bring forward, though, is with the football players um, who are a member of our uh, umbrella. We actually have a sports council within the AFL-CIO now because of these issues um, that during the pandemic, um, you know, all the employers wanted to know the safety and health data um, during the games that were being played, you know, during the pandemic. And so the wearables were um, put on steroids, no pun intended. Um, and uh, the football players union negotiated parameters around 
who owned that data and how it could be used because they saw value in the data. And so they uh, bargained the ownership of that data was the players. And then now they're able to actually use the data the way they see fit in terms of how they can create value. Um, can it be used to inform a video game in its development? And then the players can receive royalties. You know, those are the types of things that we talk about with worker ownership of data. Great. Um, Kathy C., uh, just to round things out, um, I know you mentioned that you've worked with Cortico, and I, I work with them as well. They're great, great folks. They are. Uh, some of my favorite technologists in this space. And I'm kind of curious, beyond the conversations that you facilitated, mm -hmm. what do you see as potential roles for some of these advanced tools more systemically in yeah. supporting making worker voice more efficacious in an institutionalized way? Uh, or you know, allowing yeah. representation of other stakeholders? Well, Cortical and the, the folks at the Center for Constructive Communication, they're just a great example of how um, we can make choices about how, how we incorporate technology into our lives, and we can do it for the broader public good. So for example, if you're someone like me, who's been an ethnographer for most of her career, I can only take in so much, right? I can only drive my car around Wisconsin so much time and spend so much time with so many people. But if you um, create a platform in which you listen to many groups of people in many different places, then it becomes an issue of how do you make sense of that, in all that information, right? And you can, you could do it just in a brute force automated way, which isn't ideal, I don't think, because there's, there's so much nuance and care that one ought to put into listening to fellow human beings. But you can combine tools of technology with human sensibility to do much more listening at a, at a grander scale. So in my mind, what it means is there is a possibility for much more listening of many more people to be going on and with care. Yeah, that's what we in the plurality movement call broad listening as opposed to broadcast. Oh, you know? nice phrase. Yeah. Yep. I like that. Um, uh, Liz, do you want to add something to that? Or no? no, I just listening. I think that's so yeah. critically important. Yeah. OK, great. So uh, I, I won't take up too much more time. Um, I wanted to turn to the audience if folks have questions for our distinguished panel. Your own? Yeah. Panel. Thank you, everybody. This is more for Liz, but perhaps others will weigh in as well. I mean, I think what you have all sort of uh, emphasized put slightly more broadly, we've had the wrong type of technocracy here. The right type would be, you know, we want expertise. The wrong type is some people make the decisions with globalization, financial deregulation, technology, disruption, and then that is imposed on people without their voice. So okay. the alternative, the right type of technocracy, has to have voice, worker voice, more broader voice. But then the question is, does the labor movement need to change for that as well? Meaning, are there any problems in the way that the labor movement had in approaching technology in its interplay with companies that need to change for it to be more effective in the direction of technology and how technology is used? We're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no. I know, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's true. And I think the reason why most unions would be averse to technological change off on the face of it is because of just what you said. We've never been at the table. We've never been in the design. We've never had a voice. And it always is implemented to uh, achieve cost savings and add, to add to the bottom line of the company, to make workers more efficient is usually code for like we want fewer workers and we're going to work harder for less. Um, and so I think there's a general skepticism and disdain, frankly, because uh, the process is so broken. But uh, we are starting to change that. And we had this summit at CES for that reason, because we know we need to be nimble. We need to be responsive and looking at our systems and how um, can we be more effective and efficient uh, with how even our representational models we're starting to analyze. Um, and in the bargaining process, um, there's, uh, for example, Unite Here, the hotel and hospitality workers, have um, negotiated a notice period 
so that when the employer institutes technology, they have to give notice to the union. It started at 180 days, which is quite a long time, right? They've since in their last round started shrinking that in trade-off for more um, retraining funds and pathways forward for t uh, workers who are going to be displaced mm. by technology and are finding new jobs. Mm. Um, so the notice period was really a trust builder <laughs> to say we're not gonna just be an afterthought. Um, so I think that's just one example of many of how we're trying to be more responsive, more reactive, work in partnership where we can with employers. And I'll just put a pin and we just announced a, a partnership with Microsoft now people are like, what? Uh, uh, but it's really to get workers in the labs and um, you know, get that uh, two-way communication going. But more importantly, we negotiated a neutrality agreement for union organizing because Microsoft recognizes this is the way the country is going. Workers want a voice. And if they want a union, they should have one. And we hope that that will be um, a bellwether for other tech companies to not fear worker inclusion and worker voice, but to embrace it as something that's going to be actually a net positive and a value add. One thing just to add there is that also you probably were involved that uh, when we did this deal with Activision, yep. uh, we attended a lot to the labor issues. And I thought that, that was a great piece of progress that that got brought into a major antitrust uh, merger agreement, so. And as a result, another unit within ZeniMax, once um, Microsoft said they'd be neutral, yeah. another unit of workers wanted to organize, they did, yeah. and they have a first contract already, so. That's great. Yeah. Um, just to make sure I see everyone, I'm gonna stand up. Uh, yes, back there, yeah, go ahead, yeah. with the mask. Oh. Thank you. Um, I had a question about broadening the scope of the conversation of labor to the global south. So we've seen these labor movements rising in the U.S. and the global north, it's Tesla and the, and the Nordic countries uh, battling what seems to be a pretty uh, arduous battle. Um, even in the U.S., we just had the writer's strike, et cetera, et cetera, UPS, et cetera. Um, however, I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about folks who have always been kind of at the wrong end of history when it comes to work, particularly in the global south. I'm speaking about people who for decades now have been working really low paid jobs to annotate, to moderate, right? Uh, through services like Amazon Turk, or if you look at all the Facebook, Instagram, all the social media companies are using really low paid labor, exposing workers to really hazardous conditions. So if in places like the US or Scandinavia, workers are struggling to find their place in, uh, work within the system. What hope do we have for folks that historically have lacked any sort of representation at this scale? Yeah, this a bit gets to the question that I was pushing you on, Kathy. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I guess the the situation in the in the global south is yeah, it, 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 it's sort of reflected in some ways in some sectors in the United States itself where people also lack these kinds of uh, these kinds of protections and. Um, basically, my 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 uh, like the 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 kinds of things that I would recommend for the global south would be similar to the kinds of things that I would recommend for the United States. I mean, there there's a way in which, if you look at the United States compared to any other rich democracy, we tend to forget, uh, or we what tends to sort of fade from, from, from view is the, the ways in which the U.S. is a really a big outlier. And in some ways, you know, it's an outlier in terms of sort of the, the core of benefits that, that you can expect. It's an outlier in terms of like the whole idea that you have to organize workers workplace by workplace. That's just not a thing in most of the, uh, of the rich democracies. And so many of the problems that you're citing for the for the global south are things that, of the sort that, that um, Liz was talking about when she's talking about people working two jobs to, in order to make ends meet uh, in this country. So in many ways, the kinds of prescriptions that I would have for uh, workers in the global south would be pretty similar to the ones that I have for, uh, for uh, the ununionized sectors in this country. Can I speak to that briefly? So I'm not an expert on the global south, but this, the question I think illuminates for me how important it is this theme of this is not, the future is not inevitable, right? The, the theme of the Future of the Work initiative that I love so much is this is all about choices that human beings make. And 
uh, I, this may be a little bit Pollyanna, but we, the Global South illuminates that um, norms are an institution too, and we as humans have to decide what kind of a world we want to live in. And we, we oftentimes think about the Global South in terms of what are the market forces that are gonna change things for people there. What are the choices that we make in terms of the values that we want to underpin the global economy that's going to change things for people there, right? What are the norms that we want to enforce? And um, that may make me sound like a Pollyanna, but it's, it's what I believe. I think if, if we want things to change in the global south, we have to change the way we live as humans. And that labor movements are alive and well in the global south, and we work globally together um, on these strategies so that um, what one country is doing can uplift the next. And the baseline and fundamental core of that is worker organizing and workers coming together in their communities um, you know, to build these broad coalitions because as we know, um, in collective action there is strength and that the labor movement's roots are in solidarity and that um, this notion of bringing in community partners and allies and NGOs and unions and um, you know, faith-based organizations, academics, all coming together to create the society that we want to see and be able to chart the course for these technologies to help humans. That's what we're supposed to be doing this right. for, is to actually make work better, make work safer, make work less literally backbreaking. Um, but we know that that's not just going to happen naturally, that we have to come together and organize to make that happen. Uh, in the way in the back, blonde hair. Polish, so we have a long history of labor unions there, starting from solidarity. Um, but my question is, um, maybe it's actually about the comment that the chair made. Uh, I, I was curious because I think you mentioned something about how a worker should be involved in understanding the thorough process, you know, not only their own tasks, but actually everyone's task and understand, like, have a, a better understanding and be better informed about what this work is generally or more, more holistically about. But then you mentioned something about productivity um, increase and better products. And I was sort of wondering if, if that's what the worker representatives should be worried about. Because I, I was thinking always that they should be focused on, on the protection of, of workers, you know. And I think maybe these two can be combined somehow. But I, I never thought that this would be like the goal of a worker representative to kind of uh, pay attention to more productivity or increased amount of work for the workers. Or that we work less because the gains from that productivity are shared broadly. And in theory, that's kind of what we'd like to see. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the thing I, I was just referring to is that there's, there's this guy, Edward Deming, who was very influential, especially in Japan, on the Toyota productivity system. And his mm -hmm. whole philosophy was that if workers come to holistically understand the product, then they can spot in the process of their work flaws in the process and be part of innovation, that workers can actually drive innovation. And that was central to the Japanese you know, productivity mm -hmm. miracle. So that's, that's what I was referring to. But Kathy, do you Yeah, want I'll, to? Just, I'll just yeah. tag on to that, saying that yeah, I, I, workers, of course, have an interest in the success of whatever firm they're working in, because otherwise they're, they're, they're I mean, they have to have some sort of foundational um, uh, interest in that, but their first priority is, in fact, I would say, to to defend workers' interests. But those are so compatible. And here's, you know, I have an example of the the kind of uh, thing that Liz was talking about: this balancing of, you know, safety issues with efficiency and productivity issues. And it's it it comes out of a, 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 a the case of a, a Swedish mining company, Bulletin, which wanted to introduce a, a sort of uh, a system for being able to identify and make sure, know exactly where workers were in, a, in the mine. And of course, this could be a great safety thing. It's wonderful for, you know, it can increase safety in case of, a, of an accident or something. But it was also very important to the company because they wanted to achieve efficiency gains because it would allow them to coordinate the activity of different miners who were you know, at work in different parts of the mine. 
So, you know, the union, of course, shared the, the safety concerns. They also have an interest in this, in this firm doing well. Um, but, the, but they were worried about surveillance and, and speed ups and, and all the things that can come along with um, the ability to track particular workers. Mm. Uh, they were, they were going to be outfitted with uh, digital tags. And basically, the solution that they wound up with combined these, these, these concerns. Basically, what they did was they asked the vendor, or they required the vendor to produce a system that anonymized these tags, um, and where the only uh, person that has the, uh, the the capacity to unlock the anonymized uh, tags was the union representative. So basically, they got the best of both of these worlds, right? You got the efficiency gains that the firm was after, but you also got these protections uh, for the workers and. Uh, that I love this example because that technology then, that new sort of union-friendly version of this thing became something that the vendor was able to sell and that is now diffusing to other minds. And so, you know, these are these kinds of examples where you get a better outcome uh, by actually taking account of the, uh, of the interests of workers and not just the sort of easy solution or the, uh, the firm's version of what, um, what efficiency uh, gains or pr productivity uh, demand, uh, demands, basically. I love that example because yeah. it's very related to this data cooperatives idea that, again, is very big in Taiwan and other places and also as part of Cortico's approach to privacy. So great mm -hmm. illustration of uh, thinking about that sort of collective privacy organized by uh, you know someone who's well. Can I just say one more thing on this? There is a concept in in comparative political economy called beneficial constraints, and the idea is basically, you know, managers or firms they operate in fast moving markets. They don't necessarily you know con consulting with unions is going to slow things down. It's going to it's going to force compromise, and they it's not necessarily their first choice. But very often. These, the constraints that, uh, that, the, that the need to negotiate uh, the introduction of particular technologies, uh, you know, often that will foreclose sort of easy, kind of low, low end, low road mm. kinds of strategies and force firms to be more innovative, to be more creative, to be, to sort of take a higher road strategy, um, you know, so to emphasize quality rather than just, uh, than just cost. And I think that that's, that's kind of the, the idea of these partnerships. It's not something that is chosen by, you know, firms don't seek out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have to be required right. to, uh, to negotiate. It doesn't, you can't rely on sort of employer self-enlightenment. It's just not <laughs> going to happen in that, in that particular way, I think. I think we Sorry. need to wrap up because we're a little over time. But thank you so much uh, you. to the whole panel. It was a great thank discussion. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I, 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 uh, I, I thought we, we had to end at the hour. So, so sorry about that. Okay, well, great. So time for more questions. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, exactly. We, we have more time, I guess. Oh, we do? Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, thanks. I'm glad I get an extra question. Excellent. Yeah, no, um, no, thanks for the great panel. Um, I guess I had a question. It sort of riffs off the points you all just made around sort of this whole idea of, I think, incentives, especially for management of firms, this idea that they sort of take the low road for some of these things for maybe short-term profit. But it, but it sort of strikes me that even, you know, it, as we think more about what is the role of, you know, manager incentives and maybe corporate governance more broadly, as I think about some of the examples you see, you know, in, in places like Germany where you start to have work representation on boards and that that can shape some of the incentives that companies have. Because now as we're talking about what technologies companies either go to buy or that, you know, maybe other developers are incentivized to build, that, you know, I sort of wonder if maybe sort of corporate governance is one of the, the key levers by which one can influence that. I don't know if you all have thought about that, but that's something that strikes me as maybe a, a fruitful way to, to move forward on this. You want to take it, Liz? I mean, I guess I just, you know, as to your previous point that um, corporate America generally doesn't do things out of benevolence, right? That we they need to be forced. Um, and that's where unions have always come into play is this 
balancing the scales, you know, being um, sort of an enforcement agent uh, for worker protections and worker rights. And over the course of time, I think um, unions have been perceived now to be sort of the hindrance to uh -huh. innovation or, oh, you know, it's just another step we have to go through to involve workers. And, but in the end, it actually makes companies more productive and um, better off, um, you know, their products are better and, and everyone ultimately is better off. But yes, in, in terms of corporate governance and some of the strategies that we've been using on the union side, um, using our pension fund investments, you know, is always kind of a lever that we can do to get inside that sort of shareholder uh, activism space to uh, create those tools of change um, and a lot around uh, ESG policies, of course, and I always say that the E has been capitalized and the S has been sort of like lower, lowercase. Yeah. Um, and we're trying to flip the script on that, that now with the advent of AI and, and future of work, it's more important than ever that the S take prominence. And um, we'll continue to do whatever we can to exercise those levers. Just to, just to follow up on that with one little comment. So there's this uh, sort of counter ESG thing uh, that Ron DeSantis has been all about. He calls it job security and growth. And it's kind of actually interesting because I, I wonder how you think about bringing in that counterweight perspective to bring in the workers perspective on corporate governance reform and so forth. Yeah, I, I mean, in terms of Ron DeSantis's view of what that means, um, we know his record, and we've you know looked at the state of Florida as the essentially the model for what not to do in terms yeah. of workers' rights. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we're here to work with anyone who wants yeah. to work with us, and that's the message I'll just put out there: is that we want partnership, we want collaboration, we want to talk with some of the unusual suspects and the people that are unlikely collaborators, as well as the the friends and partners that we've been working with for a long time. So right. I'll have that conversation. Yeah. Um, for one little follow-up on corporate governance as well. Um, I'm curious what you, whether you all had a reaction to the role that workers ended up playing in the open AI uh, leadership uh, debate. Let's, let's put it that way. Just rallying, uh, rallying, but, uh, you mean just rallying to, to bring him back? Yeah, uh, so that was a collective action by workers, and I was just curious what how you all think about that. I mean, I don't, I don't know um, enough about it. I thought it was an example of uh, collective action, right? Um, that looked like nascent unionism to me, because um, once workers, I call them workers, but you know, folks at, at OpenAI who. Um, you know, things were working pretty well for them for, for a while, and then a disruption occurs that was unexpected, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, I have rights. Wait a second, I need a voice. Wait a second, I need to come together with my coworkers and exercise my muscle and power. And that's essentially what they did with the open letter, and they were able to get the attention and the, you know some prominent folks weighing back in on their behalf because they could see that the talent that made this organization thrive was at risk. And so um, I would just say um, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, and we're hoping that our Microsoft partnership actually helps in this regard because you know people don't feel free to speak up unless they have protections. And you know, immigration status for a lot of workers at Microsoft, for example, um, I think they're afraid to speak up sometimes and that if they were able to unionize and have a collective voice, that would make a difference. So that's just one example of something we think this partnership can actually help us achieve. Great. Okay, David. Yeah. <clears throat> My, my question is about, and it, uh, Kathy, Kathy Phelan alluded to this, the sort of structure of worker firm negotiation in the United States, you know, goes back to the Wagner Act of 1934, and it is like trench warfare, right? One establishment at a time, and it leads to perverse outcomes, right? You know, if you said, I'm going to pass minimum wage laws, one McDonald's at a time, everyone would agree that's a bad idea, right? That's just, and, and I understand this is totally outside of your control, this is how the law is written. But I wonder if, you, if you're working on how this could be redone. Because I, I, my own 
somewhat pessimistic view is it's going to be very difficult for the labor union to really expand without a change in the structure of bargaining, without more sectoral bargaining, which is, again, what Kathy was alluding to, where you negotiate on behalf of all the workers in industry or all the workers in an occupation and so on, rather than one firm at a time, which says, you know, firms don't want to be negotiated with. They'd like to do what they want. But they'd like it even less when they say, oh, you're doing it to me but not my competitor? Like, that's terrible for me, right? And one can understand that. So I'm just, uh, I'm curious about how you're, obviously you're aware of this, how you're thinking about it and whether there's any pathway forward to change how that's done. Yeah, and I think the we all know that labor law is badly broken and tilted away from workers and the ability to organize is essentially an act of heroism in this country. People get fired, they're intimidated, they're harassed. Um, and uh, the law is just slow to respond because we don't have the resources and capacity. Um, so we're going to fight for labor law reform, as we always have, pass the PRO Act when we can get a you know Congress that will side with workers. But at the same time, we're experimenting. We are looking for new models, and you know a lot of uh, uh, thought has been given to sectoral approaches, which unfortunately work much better in Europe because of the. Um, underpinnings of a social safety net, right? We don't have that in this country, so it's not an apples to apples comparison, but approaching it in terms of sectoral thinking is something we are definitely looking at. Um, and I would say that um, the federal investments presents a huge opportunity to do that. And our Center for Transformational mm -hmm. Organizing is looking at the clean energy sector. For example, a whole new industry and economy is emerging uh, with semiconductor manufacturing and EV battery and supply chain. And we have the opportunity to land with multiple unions in a sector working together to organize um, and bring those standards up. And we, th we would hope unionize the sector, but at least work together to make sure that those are good jobs, um, that workers have a voice and collective power. And um, so that would be a sectoral approach to organizing that we think has a lot of potential. Yeah, right there. I'm, I'm very glad that David asked the question about sectoral bargaining because I'm going to sort of follow up on that. Uh, it seems like that is, of course, in the longer run, exactly the right approach. In the shorter or medium run, I, I don't know what the federal <laughs> government is able to do in terms of passing labor law, but I'm wondering two other spaces which could be potentially opened for a more democratic aspect of uh, regulating and developing uh, technology, amongst other things, uh, state level and uh, using as a sort of a federal funding to generate spaces. And in the state level, for example, Minnesota and California have both shown very interesting examples of the healthcare, uh, fast food levels, what sectoral standards can do. I'm wondering, is there a role for states, especially larger and more, you know, sort of states where a lot of innovation is happening, to have those type of tripartite stru structures uh, that state governments can actually play some role in creating those spaces that could help bring in more democratic form of governance and development of technology, and, and also what the federal government could do in that space. So I'm curious to hear more. I guess I'm the one again. Okay. Wow. Um, so yes, very exciting uh, experimentation going on at the state level. And I would say most action is happening at the state level because the federal level is so dysfunctional. Um, and uh, the fast food victory in California, incredible work. We're so excited to watch that um, evolve and see you know, what we can do to build power for workers in a sector that's sor sorely needed. Um, and it's a new model that we can learn from. Um, I would say the platform economy also is one that we're looking at. Um, how can workers uh, continue to, um, you know, without blowing up the entire system of employment and what's attached to it as an employee of a firm, getting your workers' compensation and your, um, your health care benefits, et cetera, um, you know, how can we bring those benefits to workers who are in nimble and, you know, kind of facile employment? Um, and have rights to organize on top of it. And I would say that the building trades and construction in the entertainment sector are examples of how you can have portability, flexibility, while
while at the same time having baseline protections at work. Um, and you know, we think that they're sort of, um, you know, the original DoorDash is the construction unions, where you know, for over a hundred years they've been going to a hiring hall and getting um, dispatched out for employment with a health care fund and retirement fund that all the employers pay into. They can work anywhere in the country, be trained to a standard. We think that that could be a model that could be modernized for the future. Yeah, just on, on adding on to that, I mean, one of the things that paradoxically that is a, a big impediment to sectoral bargaining in the United States is not is certainly that this workplace by workplace, the, the broken uh, labor law that really makes you, it makes it almost impossible for sectoral bargaining to sort of emerge sort of from the, from the ground up. But the other problem is actually that employers are not organized in the United States to, to organize collectively. Right. Um, yep. And so, you know, in Europe, Unionization rates are not often that high. In Germany, it's like 20% or 18% even. That's not that much uh, higher than the United States. The difference is that employers uh, belong to employers associations that are willing to negotiate with the unions. And you know, so in, 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 in countries like this, what matters way more than whether you're a member of the union is whether your employer is a member of the employers association because you will be covered by that contract no matter what. So there have to be, so Dara Durone asked earlier what has to change on the labor side for, you know, to, to adopt to these new technologies. I'd say a, a, there's a whole lot more change that would have to happen uh, on the employer side, in fact, in this country, more than, uh, than, than on the union side. I think the unions are prepared to, would be more than willing to, um, to organize on a, on a more encompassing on an encompassing way. But just on this thing, the other thing, and Liz will know more about this than, than I do, but a, a sort of functional equivalent that I've heard about is these standards boards in, uh, in nursing and home health care and things like that, which is you know a, a state level initiative in certain, you're nodding your head, I think you know about these two in, in Minnesota and so forth, uh, and I'm out of time. But basically, to set sort of standards, these are, as far as I can understand, their they're, they're, union representatives are there, their employer representatives are there, and they jointly set standards that then apply um, to, to that sector. And so that might be one initiative that one could build on in this country. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Now we're actually done. Yeah.